The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain To my wife, this book is affectionately dedicated. Preface Most of the adventures recorded in this book really occurred. One or two were experiences of my own, the rest those of boys who were schoolmates of mine. Huck Finn is drawn from life, Tom Sawyer also, but not from an individual. He is a combination of the characteristics of three boys whom I knew, and therefore belongs to the composite order of architecture. The odd superstitions touched upon were all prevalent among children and slaves in the West at the period of this story, that is to say thirty or forty years ago. Although my book is intended mainly for the entertainment of boys and girls, I hope it will not be shunned by men and women on that account, for part of my plan has been to try to pleasantly remind adults of what they once were themselves, and of how they felt and thought and talked, and what queer enterprises they sometimes engaged in. The Author Hartford, 1876 Chapter 1 Tom! No answer. Tom! No answer. What's gone with that boy, I wonder? You, Tom! No answer. The old lady pulled her spectacles down and looked over them about the room. Then she put them up and looked out under them. She seldom or never looked through them for so small a thing as a boy. They were her state pair, the pride of her heart, and were built for style, not service. She could have seen through a pair of stove lids just as well. She looked perplexed for a moment, and then said, not fiercely, but still loud enough for the furniture to hear, "'Well, I lay, if I get hold of you, I'll—' She did not finish, for by this time she was bending down and punching under the bed with a broom, and so she needed breath to punctuate the punches with. She resurrected nothing but the cat. "'I never see the beat of that boy!' She went to the open door and stood in it, and looked out among the tomato vines and jimson weeds that constituted the garden. No Tom. So she lifted up her voice at an angle calculated for distance, and shouted, You Tom! There was a slight noise behind her, and she turned just in time to seize a small boy by the slack of his roundabout and arrest his flight. There! I might have thought of that closet. What you been doing in there? Nothing. Nothing? Look at your hands, and look at your mouth. What is that truck? I don't know, Aunt. Well, I know. It's jam. That's what it is. Forty times I've said, if you didn't let that jam alone, I'll skin you. Hand me that switch. The switch hovered in the air. The peril was desperate. My! Look behind you, Aunt! The old lady whirled round and snatched her skirts out of danger. The lad fled on the instant, scrambled up the high board fence, and disappeared over it. His Aunt Polly stood surprised a moment, and then broke into a gentle laugh. "'Hang that boy! Can't I never learn anything? Ain't he played me tricks enough like that for me to be looking out for him by this time? But old fools is the biggest fools there is. Can't learn an old dog new tricks, as the saying is. But my goodness, he never plays them alike two days. And how is a body to know what's coming?' He appears to know just how long he can torment me before I get my dander up, and he knows if he can make out to put me off for a minute or make me laugh, it's all down again, and I can't hit him a lick. I ain't doing my duty by that boy, and that's the Lord's truth, goodness knows. Spare the rod and smile the child, as the good book says. I'm a-laying up sin and sufferin' for us both, I know. He's full of the old scratch, but laws o' me. He's my own dead sister's boy, poor thing, and I ain't got the heart to lash him somehow. Every time I let him off, my conscience does hurt me so, and every time I hit him, my old heart most breaks. Well, well, a man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble, as the scripture says, and I reckon it's so. He'll play hooky this evening. That's southwestern for afternoon. And I'll just be obliged to make him work tomorrow to punish him. It's mighty hard to make him work Saturdays when all the boys is having holiday, but he hates work more than he hates anything else, and I've got to do some of my duty by him, or I'll be the ruination of the child. Tom did play hooky, and he had a very good time. He got back home barely in season to help Jim, the small colored boy, 
saw next day's wood and split the kindling before supper. At least he was there in time to tell his adventures to Jim, while Jim did three-fourths of the work. Tom's younger brother, or rather half-brother, Sid, was already through with his part of the work, picking up chips, for he was a quiet boy and had no adventurous, troublesome ways. While Tom was eating his supper and stealing sugar as opportunity offered, Aunt Polly asked him questions that were full of guile and very deep, for she wanted to trap him into damaging revealments. Like many other simple-hearted souls, it was her pet vanity to believe she was endowed with a talent for dark and mysterious diplomacy, and she loved to contemplate her most transparent devices as marvels of low cunning. Said she, "'Tom, it was middling warm in school, wasn't it?' "'Yes'm. Powerful warm, wasn't it?' "'Yes'm. Didn't you want to go in a swimming, Tom?' A bit of a scare shot through Tom, a touch of uncomfortable suspicion. He searched Aunt Polly's face, but it told him nothing. So he said, "No, well, not very much. The old lady reached out her hand and felt Tom's shirt, and said, But you ain't too warm now, though. And it flattered her to reflect that she had discovered that the shirt was dry without anybody knowing that that was what she had in her mind. But in spite of her, Tom knew where the wind lay now, so he forestalled what might be the next move. Some of us pumped on our heads. Mine's damp yet, see? Aunt Polly was vexed to think she had overlooked that bit of circumstantial evidence and missed a trick. Then she had a new inspiration. "'Tom, you didn't have to undo your shirt-collar where I sewed it to pump on your head, did you? Unbutton your jacket.' The trouble vanished out of Tom's face. He opened his jacket. His shirt-collar was securely sewed. "'Bother! Well, go along with you. I'd made sure you'd played hooky and been a-swimmin', but I forgive you, Tom.' I reckon you're a kind of singed cat, as the saying is, better than you look, this time." She was half sorry her sagacity had miscarried, and half glad that Tom had stumbled into obedient conduct for once. But Sidney said, "'Well, now if I didn't think you sewed his collar with white thread, but it's black. Why, I did sew it with white. Tom!' But Tom did not wait for the rest. As he went out the door, he said, "'Siddy, I'll lick you for that.' In a safe place Tom examined two large needles, which were thrust into the lapels of his jacket, and had thread bound about them. One needle carried white thread, and the other black. He said, "'She'd never noticed if it hadn't been for Sid. Confound it! Sometimes she sews it with white, and sometimes she sews it with black. I wish to Jiminy she'd stick to one or t'other. I can't keep the run of em. But I bet I'll learn Sid for that. I'll learn him.' He was not the model boy of the village. He knew the model boy very well, though, and loathed him. Within two minutes, or even less, he had forgotten all his troubles. Not because his troubles were one whit less heavy and bitter to him than a man's are to a man, but because a new and powerful interest bore them down, and drove them out of his mind for the time. Just as men's misfortunes are forgotten in the excitement of new enterprises, this new interest was a valued novelty in whistling, which he had just acquired from a negro and he was suffering to practice it undisturbed. It consisted in a peculiar bird-like turn, a sort of liquid warble, produced by touching the tongue to the roof of the mouth at short intervals in the midst of the music. The reader probably remembers how to do it, if he has ever been a boy. Diligence and attention soon gave him the knack of it, and he strode down the street with his mouth full of harmony and his soul full of gratitude. He felt much as an astronomer feels who has discovered a new planet. No doubt, as far as strong, deep, unalloyed pleasure is concerned, the advantage was with the boy, not the astronomer. The summer evenings were long. It was not dark yet. Presently Tom checked his whistle. A stranger was before him, a boy a shade larger than himself. A newcomer of any age or either sex was an impressive curiosity in the poor little shabby village of St. Petersburg. This boy was well-dressed, too, well-dressed on a weekday. This was simply astounding. His cap was a dainty thing, his close-buttoned blue cloth roundabout was new and natty, and so were his pantaloons. He had shoes on, and it was only Friday. He even wore a necktie, a bright bit of ribbon. He had a citified air about him that ate into Tom's vitals. The more Tom stared at the splendid marvel, the higher he turned up his nose at his finery, 
and the shabbier and shabbier his own outfit seemed to him to grow. Neither boy spoke. If one moved, the other moved, but only sidewise, in a circle. They kept face to face and eye to eye all the time. Finally Tom said, "'I can lick you.' "'I'd like to see you try it.' "'Well, I can do it.' "'No, you can't either.' "'Yes, I can.' "'No, you can't. I can.' "'You can't. Can. Can't.' An uncomfortable pause. Then Tom said, "'What's your name? Tisn't any of your business, maybe?' "'Well, I allow I'll make it my business.' "'Well, why don't you? If you say much, I will.' "'Much, much, much. There, now. Oh, you think you're mighty smart, don't you? I could lick you with one hand tied behind me if I wanted to.' "'Well, why don't you do it? You say you can do it.' "'Well, I will, if you fool with me.' Oh, yes, I've seen whole families in the same fix. Smarty, you think you're some now, don't you? Oh, you, what a hat! You can lump that hat if you don't like it. I dare you to knock it off. And anybody that'll take a dare will suck eggs. You're a liar. You're another. You're a fighting liar and doesn't take it up. Ah, take a walk. Say, if you give me much more of your sass, I'll take and bounce a rock off in your head. Oh, of course you will. Well, I will. Well, why don't you do it, then? Why do you keep saying you will for? Why don't you do it? It's because you're afraid. I ain't afraid. You are. I ain't. You are. Another pause, and more eyeing and sidling around each other. Presently they were shoulder to shoulder. Tom said, Get away from me. Go away yourself. I won't. Well, I won't either. So they stood, each with a foot placed at an angle as a brace, and both shoving with might and main, and glowering at each other with hate. But neither could get an advantage. After struggling till both were hot and flushed, each relaxed his strain with watchful caution, and Tom said, "'You're a coward and a pup. I'll tell my big brother on you, and he can thrash you with his little finger, and I'll make him do it, too. What do I care for your big brother? I've got a brother that's bigger than he is, and what's more, he can throw him over that fence, too.' Both brothers were imaginary. "'That's a lie!' Your saying so doesn't make it so. Tom drew a line in the dust with his big toe and said, I dare you to step over that, and I'll lick you till you can't stand up. Anybody that'll take a dare will steal sheep. The new boy stepped over promptly and said, Now you said you'd do it. Now let's see you do it. Don't you crowd me now. You better look out. Well, you said you'd do it. Why don't you do it? By jingo, for two cents I will do it. The new boy took two broad coppers out of his pocket and held them out with derision. Tom struck them to the ground. In an instant both boys were rolling and tumbling in the dirt, gripped together like cats, and for the space of a minute they tugged and tore at each other's hair and clothes, punched and scratched each other's noses, and covered themselves with dust and glory. Presently the confusion took form, and through the fog of battle Tom appeared, seated astride the new boy and pounding him with his fists. "'Holler enough!' said he. The boy only struggled to free himself. He was crying, mainly from rage. "'Holler enough!' and the pounding went on. At last the stranger got out a smothered, "'Nuff!' and Tom let him up and said, "'Now that'll learn you. Better look out who you're fooling with next time.' The new boy went off brushing the dust from his clothes, sobbing, snuffling, and occasionally looking back and shaking his head and threatening what he would do to Tom the next time he caught him out to which Tom responded with jeers and started off in a high feather, and as soon as his back was turned the new boy snatched up a stone, threw it, and hit him between the shoulders, and then turned tail and ran like an antelope. Tom chased the traitor home, and thus found out where he lived. He then held a position at the gate for some time, daring the enemy to come outside, but the enemy only made faces at him through the window and declined. At last the enemy's mother appeared, and called Tom a bad, vicious, vulgar child, and ordered him away. So he went away, but he said he allowed to lay for that boy. He got home pretty late that night, and when he climbed cautiously in at the window he uncovered an ambuscade in the person of his aunt. And when she saw the state his clothes were in, her resolution to turn his Saturday holiday into captivity at hard labor became adamantine in its firmness. CHAPTER Two, THE GLORIOUS WHITEWASHER Saturday morning was come, and all the summer world was bright and fresh, and brimming with life. 
there was a song in every heart, and if the heart was young, the music issued at the lips. There was cheer in every face, and a spring in every step. The locust trees were in bloom, and the fragrance of the blossoms filled the air. Cardiff Hill, beyond the village and above it, was green with vegetation, and it lay just far enough away to seem a delectable land, dreamy, reposeful, and inviting. Tom appeared on the sidewalk with a bucket of whitewash and a long-handled brush. He surveyed the fence, and all gladness left him, and a deep melancholy settled down upon his spirit. Thirty yards of board fence nine feet high. Life to him seemed hollow, an existence but a burden. Sighing, he dipped his brush and passed it along the topmost plank, repeated the operation, did it again, compared the insignificant whitewashed streak with the far-reaching continent of unwhitewashed fence, and sat down on a tree-box discouraged. Jim came skipping out at the gate with a tin pail and singing Buffalo Gals. Bringing water from the town pump had always been hateful work in Tom's eyes before, but now it did not strike him so. He remembered that there was company at the pump. White, mulatto, and negro boys and girls were always there waiting their turns, resting, trading, playthings, quarreling, fighting, skylarking. And he remembered that although the pump was only a hundred and fifty yards off, Jim never got back with a bucket of water under an hour, and even then somebody generally had to go after him. Tom said, "'Say, Jim, I'll fetch the water if you'll whitewash some.' Jim shook his head and said, "'Can't, Mars Tom. Old missus, she told me I got to go and get this water and stop fooling around with anybody. She say she spec Mars Tom going to ax me to whitewash, and so she told me to go along and tend to my own business. She allowed she'd tend to, to whitewashing. Oh, never mind what she said, Jim. That's the way she always talks. Give me the bucket. I, I won't be gone only a minute. She won't ever know.' Oh, I dasn't, Mars Tom. Old Missus, she'd taken tar to head offen me. Deed she would. She, she never licks anybody. Wax em over the head with her thimble, and who cares for that, I'd like to know. She talks awful, but talk don't hurt. Anyways, it don't if she don't cry. Jim, I'll give you a marvel. I'll give you a white alley. Jim began to waver. White alley, Jim, and it's a bully taw. My, that's a mighty gay marvel, I tell you. But Mars Tom, I's powerful afraid o' old missus. And besides, if you will, I'll show you my sore toe. Jim was only human. This attraction was too much for him. He put down his pail, took the white alley, and bent over the toe with absorbing interest while the bandage was being unwound. In another moment he was flying down the street with his pail and a tingling rear. Tom was whitewashing with vigor and Aunt Polly was retiring from the field with a slipper in her hand and triumph in her eye. But Tom's energy did not last. He began to think of the fun he had planned for this day, and his sorrows multiplied. Soon the free boys would come tripping along on all sorts of delicious expeditions, and they would make a world of fun of him for having to work. The very thought of it burnt him like fire. He got out his worldly wealth and examined it. Bits of toys, marbles, and trash. Enough to buy an exchange of work, maybe, but not half enough to buy so much as half an hour of pure freedom. So he returned his straightened means to his pocket, and gave up the idea of trying to buy the boys. At this dark and hopeless moment an inspiration burst upon him, nothing less than a great, magnificent inspiration. He took up his brush and went tranquilly to work. Ben Rogers hove in sight presently, the very boy of all boys, whose ridicule he had been dreading. Ben's gait was the hop, skip, and jump, proof enough that his heart was light and his anticipations high. He was eating an apple, and giving a long, melodious whoop at intervals, followed by a deep-toned ding-dong-dong, ding-dong-dong, for he was personating a steamboat. As he drew near, he slackened speed, took the middle of the road, leaned far over to starboard, and rounded too, ponderously and with laborious pomp and circumstance, for he was personating the big Missouri, and considered himself to be drawing nine feet of water. He was boat and captain and engine bells combined, so he had to imagine himself standing on his own hurricane deck giving the orders and executing them. "'Stop her, sir!' 
ding-a-ling-a-ling. The headway ran almost out, and he drew up slowly towards the sidewalk. Ship up to back, ting-a-ling-a-ling. His arms straightened and stiffened down his sides. Set her back on the starboard, ting-a-ling-a-ling. Chow, 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 chow. His right hand, meantime, described stately circles, for it was representing a forty-foot wheel. Let her go back on the larboard, ting-a-ling-a-ling. Chow, chow, chow. The left hand began to describe circles. Stop the starboard. Ting-a-ling-ling. Stop the larboard. Come ahead on the starboard. Stop her. Let her outside. Turn her over slow. Ting-a-ling. Chow, ch chow, chow. Get out that headline. Lively now. Come. Come out of there with your spring line. What are you about there? Take up a turn in that stump with the bright of it. Stand by that stage. Now let, let her go. Done with the engine, sir. Ting-a-ling-ling. Shh, sh sh trying the gauge cocks. Tom went on whitewashing, paid no attention to the steamboat. Ben stared a moment and then said, Hi, you're up a stump, ain't you? No answer. Tom surveyed his last touch with the eye of an artist. Then he gave his brush another gentle sweep and surveyed the result as before. Ben ranged up alongside of him. Tom's mouth watered for the apple, but he stuck to his work. Ben said, Hello, old chap. You got to work, hey? Tom wheeled suddenly and said, Why, it's you, Ben. I weren't noticing. Say, I'm going in a-swimming. I am. Don't you wish you could? But of course you'd rather work, wouldn't you? Of course you would. Tom contemplated the boy a bit and said, What do you call work? Why, ain't that work? Tom resumed his whitewashing and answered carelessly, Well, maybe it is and maybe it ain't. All I know is it suits Tom Sawyer. Oh, come now, you don't mean to let on that like you like that. The brush continued to move. Like it? Well, I don't see why I oughtn't to like it. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day? That put the thing in a new light. Ben stopped nibbling his apple. Tom swept his brush daintily back and forth, stepped back to note the effect, added a touch here and there, criticized the effect again, Ben, watching every move and getting more and more interested, more and more absorbed, presently he said, "'Say, Tom, let me whitewash a little.' Tom considered, was about to consent, but he altered his mind. "'No, no, I reckon it wouldn't hardly do, Ben. You see, Aunt Polly's awful particular about this fence, right here on the street, you know. But if it was the back fence, I wouldn't mind, and she wouldn't. Yes, she's awful particular about this fence. It's got to be done very careful.' I reckon there ain't one boy in a thousand, may maybe two thousand, that can do it the way it's got to be done. No, is that so? Oh, come now, let me just try. Only just a little. I'd let you if you was me, Tom. Ben, I I'd like to, honest Injun. But Aunt Polly, well, Jim wanted to do it, but she wouldn't let him. Sid wanted to do it, and she wouldn't let Sid. Now, don't you see how I'm fixed? If you was to tackle this fence and anything was to happen to it, oh shucks, I'll be just as careful. Now let me try. Say, I'll give you the core of my apple. Well, here. No, no, Ben, no, now don't. I, I'm afeard. I'll give you all of it. Tom gave up the brush with reluctance in his face, but alacrity in his heart. And while the late steamer Big Missouri worked and sweated in the sun, the retired artist sat on a barrel in the shade close by dangled his legs, munched his apple, and planned the slaughter of more innocents. There was no lack of material. Boys happened along every little while. They came to jeer, but remained to whitewash. By the time Ben was fagged out, Tom had traded the next chance to Billy Fisher for a kite in good repair. And when he played out, Johnny Miller bought in for a dead rat and a string to swing it with, and so on and so on, hour after hour. And when the middle of the afternoon came, from being a poor, poverty-stricken boy in the morning, Tom was literally rolling in wealth. He had, beside the things before mentioned, twelve marbles, part of a Jew's harp, a piece of blue bottle glass to look through, a spool cannon, a key that wouldn't unlock anything, a fragment of chalk, a glass stopper of a decanter, a tin soldier, a couple of tadpoles, six firecrackers, a kitten with only one eye, a brass doorknob, a dog collar, but no dog, the handle of a knife, four pieces of orange peel, 
and a dilapidated old window sash. He had had a nice, good, idle time all the while, plenty of company, and the fence had had three coats of whitewash on it. If he hadn't run out of whitewash, he would have bankrupted every boy in the village. Tom said to himself that it was not such a hollow world after all. He had discovered a great law of human action without knowing it, namely, that in order to make a man or boy covet a thing, it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. If he had been a great and wise philosopher, like the writer of this book, he would now have comprehended that work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do, and that play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. And this would help him to understand why constructing artificial flowers, or performing on a treadmill, is work, while rolling ten-pins or climbing Mont Blanc is only amusement. There are wealthy gentlemen in England who drive four-horse passenger coaches twenty or thirty miles on a daily line in the summer because the privilege costs them considerable money. But if they were offered wages for the service, that would turn it into work, and then they would resign. The boy mused a while over the substantial change which had taken place in his worldly circumstances, and then wended toward headquarters to report. Fire, Chapter 3 Busy at War and Love Tom presented himself before Aunt Polly, who was sitting by an open window in a pleasant rearward apartment, which was bedroom, breakfast-room, dining-room, and library combined. The balmy summer air, the restful quiet, the odor of the flowers, and the drowsing murmur of the bees had had their effect, and she was nodding over her knitting, for she had no company but the cat, and it was asleep in her lap. Her spectacles were propped up on her gray head for safety. She had thought that, of course, Tom had deserted long ago, and she wondered at seeing him place himself in her power again in this intrepid way. He said, "'Mayn't I go and play now, Aunt?' "'What, already? How much have you done?' "'It's all done, Aunt.' "'Tom, don't lie to me. I can't bear it.' "'I ain't, Aunt. It is all done.' Aunt Polly placed small trust in such evidence. She went out to see for herself, and she would have been content to find twenty per cent of Tom's statement true, when she found the entire fence whitewashed, and not only whitewashed, but elaborately coated and recoated, and even a streak added to the ground. Her astonishment was almost unspeakable. She said, "'Well, I never. There's no getting round it. You can work when you're a mind to, Tom.' And then she diluted the compliment by adding, "'But it's powerful seldom you're a mind to, I'm bound to say. Well, go along and play, but mind you get back some time in the week, or I'll tan you.' She was so overcome by the splendor of his achievement that she took him into the closet and selected a choice apple and delivered it to him, along with an improving lecture upon the added value and flavor a treat took to itself when it came without sin through virtuous effort." and while she closed with a happy scriptural flourish, he hooked a doughnut. Then he skipped out and saw Sid just starting up the outside stairway that led to the back rooms on the second floor. Clods were handy, and the air was full of them in a twinkling. They raged around Sid like a hailstorm, and before Aunt Polly could collect her surprised faculties and sally to the rescue, six or seven clods had taken personal effect, and Tom was over the fence and gone. There was a gate— but as a general thing he was too crowded for time to make use of it. His soul was at peace now that he had settled with Sid for calling attention to his black thread and getting him into trouble. Tom skirted the block and came round into a muddy alley that led by the back of his aunt's cow-stable. He presently got safely beyond the reach of capture and punishment and hastened towards the public square of the village, where two military companies of boys had met for conflict according to previous appointment. Tom was general of one of these armies, Joe Harper, a bosom friend, general of the other. These two great commanders did not condescend to fight in person, that being better suited to the still smaller fry, but sat together on an eminence and conducted the field operations by orders delivered through aide-de-camp. Tom's army won a great victory after a long and hard-fought battle. Then the dead were counted, prisoners exchanged, the terms of the next disagreement agreed upon, and the day for the necessary battle appointed. 
after which the armies fell into line and marched away, and Tom turned homeward alone. As he was passing by the house where Jeff Thatcher lived, he saw a new girl in the garden, a lovely little blue-eyed creature with yellow hair plaited into two long tails, white summer frock, and embroidered pantalettes. The fresh-crowned hero fell without firing a shot. A certain Amy Lawrence vanished out of his heart, and left not even a memory of herself behind. He had thought he loved her to distraction. He had regarded his passion as adoration, and, behold, it was only a poor little evanescent partiality. He had been months winning her. She had confessed hardly a week ago. He had been the happiest and the proudest boy in the world only seven short days, and here in one instant of time she had gone out of his heart like a casual stranger whose visit is done. He worshipped this new angel with furtive eye till he saw that she had discovered him. Then he pretended he did not know she was present, and began to show off in all sorts of absurd boyish ways in order to win her admiration. He kept up this grotesque foolishness for some time, but by and by, while he was in the midst of some dangerous gymnastic performances, he glanced aside and saw that the little girl was wending her way toward the house. Tom came up to the fence and leaned on it, grieving, and hoping she would tarry yet a while longer. She halted a moment on the steps and then moved toward the door. Tom heaved a great sigh as she put her foot on the threshold. But his face lit up right away, for she tossed a pansy over the fence a moment before she disappeared. The boy ran around and stopped within a foot or two of the flower, and then shaded his eyes with his hand and began to look down street as if he had discovered something of interest going on in that direction. Presently he picked up a straw and began trying to balance it on his nose, with his head tilted far back. And as he moved from side to side in his efforts, he edged nearer and nearer toward the pansy. Finally his bare foot rested upon it, his pliant toes closed upon it, and he hopped away with a treasure and disappeared round the corner. But only for a minute, only while he could button the flower inside his jacket, next his heart, or next his stomach, possibly, for he was not much posted in anatomy, and not hypercritical, anyway. He returned now, and hung about the fence till nightfall, showing off as before, but the girl never exhibited herself again, though Tom comforted himself a little with the hope that she had been near some window, meantime, and been aware of his attentions. Finally he rode home reluctantly, with his poor head full of visions. All through supper his spirits were so high that his aunt wondered what had got into the child. He took a good scolding about clodding Sid, and did not seem to mind it in the least. He tried to steal sugar under his aunt's very nose, and got his knuckles wrapped for it. He said, "'Aunt, you don't whack Sid when he takes it. Well, Sid don't torment a body the way you do. You'd be always into that sugar if I weren't watching you.' Presently she stepped into the kitchen, and Sid, happy in his immunity, reached for the sugar-bowl, a sort of glorying over Tom which was well-nigh unbearable. But Sid's fingers slipped, and the bowl dropped and broke. Tom was in ecstasies, in such ecstasies that he even controlled his tongue and was silent. He said to himself that he would not speak a word, even when his aunt came in, but would sit perfectly still till she asked who did the mischief, and then he would tell and there would be nothing so good in the world as to see that pet model catch it. He was so brimful of exultation that he could hardly hold himself when the old lady came back and stood above the wreck discharging lightnings of wrath from over her spectacles. He said to himself, Now it's coming, and the next instant he was sprawling on the floor. The potent palm was uplifted to strike again when Tom cried out, Hold on now, what are you belting me for? Sid broke it. Aunt Polly paused, perplexed, and Tom looked for healing pity. But when she got her tongue again, she only said, Humph! Well, you didn't get a lick amiss, I reckon. You've been into some other audacious mischief when I wasn't around like enough. Then her conscience reproached her, and she yearned to say something kind and loving. But she judged that this would be construed into a confession that she had been in the wrong, and discipline forbade that. So she kept silence, and went about her affairs with a troubled heart. Tom sulked in a corner and exalted his woes. He knew that in her heart his aunt was on her knees to him, and he was morosely gratified by the consciousness of it. He would hang out no signals. He would take notice of none. 
He knew that a yearning glance fell upon him now and then through a film of tears, but he refused recognition of it. He pictured himself lying sick unto death, and his aunt bending over him, beseeching one little forgiving word, but he would turn his face to the wall and die with that word unsaid. Ah, how would she feel then! And he pictured himself brought home from the river, dead, with his curls all wet and his sore heart at rest. How she would throw herself upon him, and how her tears would fall like rain, and her lips pray God to give her back her boy, and she would never, never abuse him any more. But he would lie there, cold and white, and make no sign, a poor little sufferer whose griefs were at an end. He so worked upon his feelings with the pathos of these dreams that he had to keep swallowing, he was so like to choke, and his eyes swam in a blur of water which overflowed when he winked and ran down and trickled from the end of his nose. And such a luxury to him was this petting of his sorrows that he could not bear to have any worldly cheeriness or any grating delight intrude upon it. It was too sacred for such contact. And so, presently, when his cousin Mary danced in, all alive with the joy of seeing home again after an age-long visit of one week to the country, he got up and moved in clouds and darkness out at one door as she brought song and sunshine in at the other. He wandered far from the accustomed haunts of boys and sought desolate places that were in harmony with his spirit. A log raft in the river invited him, and he seated himself on its outer edge and contemplated the dreary vastness of the stream, wishing the while that he could only be drowned all at once and unconsciously without undergoing the uncomfortable routine devised by nature. Then he thought of his flower. He got it out, rumpled and wilted, and it mightily increased his dismal felicity. He wondered if she would pity him if she knew. Would she cry and wish that she had a right to put her arms round his neck and comfort him? Or would she turn coldly away like all the hollow world? This picture brought such an agony of pleasurable suffering that he worked it over and over again in his mind, and set it up in new and varied lights till he wore it threadbare. At last he rose up sighing, and departed in the darkness. About half-past nine or ten o'clock he came along the deserted street to where the adored unknown lived. He paused a moment. No sound fell upon his listening ear. A candle was casting a dull glow upon the curtain of a second-story window. Was the sacred presence there? He climbed the fence, threaded his stealthy way through the plants, till he stood under that window. He looked up at it long and with emotion. Then he laid him down on the ground under it, disposing himself upon his back, with his hands clasped upon his breast and holding his poor wilted flower. And thus he would die, out in the cold world, with no shelter over his homeless head, no friendly hand to wipe the death damps from his brow no loving face to bend pityingly over him when the great agony came. And thus she would see him when she looked out upon the glad morning, and, oh, would she drop one little tear upon his poor lifeless form, would she heave one little sigh to see a bright young life so rudely blighted, so untimely cut down? The window went up, a maidservant's discordant voice profaned the holy calm, and a deluge of water drenched the prone martyr's remains. The strangling hero sprang up with a relieving snort. There was a whiz as of a missile in the air, mingled with a murmur of a curse, a sound as of shivering glass followed, and a small vague form went over the fence and shot away in the gloom. Not long after, as Tom, all undressed for bed, was surveying his drenched garments by the light of a tallow dip, Sid woke up. But if he had any dim idea of making any references to illusions, he thought better of it and held his peace for there was danger in Tom's eye. Tom turned in without the added vexation of prayers, and Sid made mental note of the omission. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Showing Off in Sunday School The sun rose upon a tranquil world and beamed down upon the peaceful village like a benediction. Breakfast over, Aunt Polly had family worship. It began with a prayer built from the ground up of solid courses of scriptural quotations, welded together with a thin mortar of originality. And from the summit of this she delivered a grim chapter of the Mosaic Law, as from Sinai. Then Tom girded up his loins, so to speak, and went to work to get his verses. Sid had learned his lesson days before, 
Tom bent all his energies to the memorizing of five verses, and he chose part of the Sermon on the Mount because he could find no verses that were shorter. At the end of half an hour Tom had a vague general idea of his lesson, but no more, for his mind was traversing the whole field of human thought, and his hands were busy with distracting recreations. Mary took his book to hear him recite, and he tried to find his way through the fog. "'Blessed are the, uh, uh, poor? Yes, poor. Blessed are the poor, uh, in spirit. In spirit! Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they, they, theirs. For theirs! Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they, they, sh, for they, uh, s-h-a. For they, s h oh, I don't know what it is, shall. Oh, shall. For they shall, for they shall, uh, uh, shall mourn. Uh, uh, blessed are they that shall, the, they that, uh, they that shall mourn, for they shall, uh, shall what? Why, why don't you tell me, Mary? What do you want to be so mean for? Oh, Tom, you poor thick-headed thing. I'm not teasing you. I wouldn't do that. You must go and learn it again. Don't you be discouraged, Tom. You'll manage it, and if you do, I'll give you something ever so nice. There, now, that's a good boy. All right. What is it, Mary? Tell me what it is. Never you mind, Tom. You know if I say it's nice, it is nice. You bet you that's so, Mary. All right, I'll tackle it again. And he did tackle it again, and under the double pressure of curiosity and prospective gain, he did it with such spirit that he accomplished a shining success. Mary gave him a brand new Barlow knife worth twelve and a half cents, and the convulsion of delight that swept his system shook him to his foundations. True, the knife would not cut anything, but it was a sure enough Barlow, and there was inconceivable grandeur in that, though where the Western boys ever got the idea that such a weapon could possibly be counterfeited to its injury is an imposing mystery and will always remain so, perhaps. Tom contrived to scarify the cupboard with it, and was arranging to begin on the bureau when he was called off to dress for Sunday school. Mary gave him a tin basin of water and a piece of soap, and he went outside the door and set the basin on a little bench there. Then he dipped the soap in the water and laid it down, turned up his sleeves, poured out the water on the ground gently, and then entered the kitchen and began to wipe his face diligently on the towel behind the door. But Mary removed the towel and said, "'Now ain't you ashamed, Tom?' You mustn't be so bad. Water won't hurt you. Tom was a trifle disconcerted. The basin was refilled, and this time he stood over it a little while, gathering resolution, took in a big breath, and began. When he entered the kitchen presently, with both eyes shut and groping for the towel with his hands, an honorable testimony of suds and water was dripping from his face. But when he emerged from the towel, he was not yet satisfactory, for the clean territory stopped short at his chin and his jaws like a mask. Below and beyond this line there was a dark expanse of unirrigated soil that spread downward in front and backward around his neck. Mary took him in hand, and when she was done with him, he was a man and a brother without distinction of color, and his saturated hair was neatly brushed and its short curls wrought into a dainty and symmetrical general effect. He privately smoothed out the curls with labor and difficulty, and plastered his hair close down to his head, for he held curls to be effeminate, and his own filled his life with bitterness. Then Mary got out a suit of his clothing that had been used only on Sundays during two years. They were simply called his other clothes, and so by that we know the size of his wardrobe. The girl put him to rights after he had dressed himself. She buttoned his neat roundabout up to his chin, turned his vast shirt-collar down over his shoulders, brushed him off, and crowned him with his speckled straw hat. He now looked exceedingly improved and uncomfortable. He was fully as uncomfortable as he looked, for there was a restraint about whole clothes and cleanliness that galled him. He hoped that Mary would forget his shoes, but the hope was blighted. She coated them thoroughly with tallow, as was the custom and brought them out. He lost his temper, and said he was always being made to do everything he didn't want to do. But Mary said persuasively, "'Please, Tom, that's a good boy.' So he got into the shoes, snarling. Mary was soon ready, and the three children set out for Sunday school, a place that Tom hated with his whole heart, 
but Sid and Mary were fond of. Sabbath school hours were from nine to half past ten, and then church service. Two of the children always remained for the sermon voluntarily, and the other always remained too, for stronger reasons. The church's high-backed, uncushioned pews would seat about three hundred persons. The edifice was but a small, plain affair, with a sort of pine-board tree-box on top of it for a steeple. At the door Tom dropped back a step and accosted a Sunday-dressed comrade. "'Say, Billy, got a yaller ticket?' "'Yes.' "'Well, you take for her. Well, you give.' piece of licorice and a fish-hook. Let's see em. Tom exhibited. They were satisfactory, and the property changed hands. Then Tom traded a couple of white alleys for three red tickets, and some small trifle or other for a couple of blue ones. He waylaid other boys as they came, and went on buying tickets of various colors ten or fifteen minutes longer. He entered the church, now with a swarm of clean and noisy boys and girls, proceeded to his seat, and started a quarrel with the first boy that came handy. The teacher, a grave elderly man, interfered, then turned his back a moment, and Tom pulled a boy's hair in the next bench, and was absorbed in his book when the boy turned round, stuck a pin in another boy presently in order to hear him say, Ouch! and got a new reprimand from his teacher. Tom's whole class were of a pattern, restless, noisy, and troublesome. When they came to recite their lessons, not one of them knew his verses perfectly, but had to be prompted all along. However, they worried through, and each got his reward in small blue tickets, each with a passage of scripture on it. Each blue ticket was pay for two verses of the recitation. Ten blue tickets equaled a red one, and could be exchanged for it. Ten red tickets equaled a yellow one. For ten yellow tickets the superintendent gave a very plainly bound Bible, worth forty cents in those easy days, to the pupil. How many of my readers would have the industry and application to memorize two thousand verses even for a Doré Bible? And yet Mary had acquired two Bibles in this way. It was the patient work of two years, and a boy of German parentage had won four or five. He once recited three thousand verses without stopping. But the strain upon his mental faculties was too great, and he was little better than an idiot from that day forth. A grievous misfortune for the school for on great occasions before company the superintendent, as Tom expressed it, had always made this boy come out and spread himself. Only the older pupils managed to keep their tickets and stick to their tedious work long enough to get a Bible, and so the delivery of one of these prizes was a rare and noteworthy circumstance. The successful pupil was so great and conspicuous for that day that on the spot every scholar's heart was fired with a fresh ambition that often lasted a couple of weeks. It is possible that Tom's mental stomach had never really hungered for one of those prizes, but unquestionably his entire being had for many a day longed for the glory and the eclat that came with it. In due course the superintendent stood up in front of the pulpit with a closed hymn-book in his hand and his forefinger inserted between its leaves and commanded attention. When a Sunday school superintendent makes his customary little speech, a hymn book in the hand is as necessary as is the inevitable sheet of music in the hand of a singer who stands forward on the platform and sings a solo at a concert. Though why is a mystery, for neither the hymn book nor the sheet of music is ever referred to by the sufferer. This superintendent was a slim creature of thirty-five, with a sandy goatee and short sandy hair. He wore a stiff standing collar whose upper edge almost reached his ears, and whose sharp points curved forward abreast the corners of his mouth, a fence that compelled a straight lookout ahead and a turning of the whole body when a side view was required. His chin was propped on a spreading cravat, which was as broad and as long as a banknote, and had fringed ends. His boot toes were turned sharply up in the fashion of the day, like sleigh-runners, an effect patiently and laboriously produced by the young men by sitting with their toes pressed against a wall for hours together. Mr. Walters was very earnest of mien, and very sincere and honest at heart, and he held sacred things and places in such reverence, and so separated them from worldly matters, that unconsciously to himself his Sunday-school voice had acquired a peculiar intonation which was wholly absent on weekdays. He began after this fashion. "'Now, children, I want you all to sit up just as straight and pretty as you can, and give me all your attention for a minute or two. 
There, that is it. That is the way good little boys and girls should do. I see one little girl who is looking out of the window. I am afraid she thinks I am out there somewhere, perhaps up in one of the trees making a speech to the little birds. A plausive titter. I want to tell you how good it makes me feel to see so many bright, clean little faces assembled in a place like this, learning to do right and be good, and so forth and so on. It is not necessary to set down the rest of the oration. It was of a pattern which does not vary, and so it is familiar to us all. The latter third of the speech was marred by the resumption of fights and other recreations among certain of the bad boys, and by fidgetings and whisperings that extended far and wide, washing even to the bases of isolated and incorruptible rocks like Sid and Mary. But now every sound ceased suddenly, with the subsidence of Mr. Walter's voice, and the conclusion of the speech was received with a burst of silent gratitude. A good part of the whispering had been occasioned by an event which was more or less rare, the entrance of visitors. Lawyer Thatcher, accompanied by a very feeble and aged man, a fine, portly, middle-aged gentleman with iron-gray hair, and a dignified lady who was doubtless the latter's wife. The lady was leading a child. Tom had been restless and full of chafings and repinings, conscience-smitten, too. He could not meet Amy Lawrence's eye. He could not brook her loving gaze. But when he saw this small newcomer, his soul was all ablaze with bliss in a moment. The next moment he was showing off with all his might, cuffing boys, pulling hair, making faces, in a word, using every art that seemed likely to fascinate a girl and win her applause. His exaltations had but one alloy, the memory of his humiliation in this angel's garden, and that record in sand was fast washing out under the waves of happiness that were sweeping over it now. The visitors were given the highest seat of honor, and as soon as Mr. Walter's speech was finished he introduced them to the school. The middle-aged man turned out to be a prodigious personage, no less a one than the county judge, altogether the most august creation these children had ever looked upon, and they wondered what kind of material he was made of, and they half wanted to hear him roar, and were half afraid he might, too. He was from Constantinople, twelve miles away, so he had traveled, and seen the world. These very eyes had looked upon the county courthouse, which was said to have a tin roof. The awe which these reflections inspired was attested by the impressive silences and the ranks of staring eyes. This was the great Judge Thatcher, brother of their own lawyer. Jeff Thatcher immediately went forward to be familiar with the great man and be envied by the school. It would have been music to his soul to hear the whisperings, "'Look at him, Jim. He's a-going up there. Say, look, he's a-going to shake hands with him. He is shaking hands with him. By jings, don't you wish you was Jeff?' Mr. Walters fell to showing off with all sorts of official bustlings and activities, giving orders and delivering judgments, discharging directions here, there, everywhere, that he could find a target. The librarian showed off, running hither and thither with his arms full of books, and making a deal of the splutter and fuss that insect authority delights in. The young lady teachers showed off, bending sweetly over pupils that were lately being boxed, lifting pretty warning fingers at bad little boys, and patting good ones lovingly. The young gentlemen teachers showed off with small scoldings and other little displays of authority, and fine attention to discipline, and most of the teachers of both sexes found business up at the library by the pulpit. And it was business that frequently had to be done over again two or three times with much seeming vexation. The little girls showed off in various ways, and the little boys showed off with such diligence that the air was thick with paper wads and the murmur of scuffling. And above it all the great man sat and beamed a majestic judicial smile upon all the house, and warmed himself in the sun of his own grandeur, for he was showing off, too. There was only one thing wanting to make Mr. Walter's ecstasy complete and that was a chance to deliver a Bible prize and exhibit a prodigy. Several pupils had a few yellow tickets, but none had enough, and he had been around among the star pupils inquiring. He would have given worlds now to have that German lad back again with a sound mind. And now at this moment, when hope was dead, Tom Sawyer came forward with nine yellow tickets, nine red tickets, and ten blue ones, and demanded a Bible.
This was a thunderbolt out of a clear sky. Walters was not expecting an application from this source for the next ten years. But there was no getting around it. Here were the certified checks, and they were good for their face. Tom was therefore elevated to a place with the judge and the other elect, and the great news was announced from headquarters. It was the most stunning surprise of the decade, and so profound was the sensation that it lifted the new hero up to the judicial one's altitude, and the school had two marvels to gaze upon in place of one. The boys were all eaten up with envy, and those that suffered the bitterest pangs were those who perceived too late that they themselves had contributed to this hated splendor by trading tickets to Tom for the wealth he had amassed in selling whitewashing privileges. These despised themselves as being the dupes of a wily fraud, a guileful snake in the grass. The prize was delivered to Tom with as much effusion as the superintendent could pump up under the circumstances, but it lacked somewhat of the true gush, for the poor fellow's instinct taught him that there was a mystery here that could not well bear the light, perhaps. It was simply preposterous that this boy had warehoused two thousand sheaves of scriptural wisdom on his premises. A dozen would strain his capacity, without a doubt. Amy Lawrence was proud and glad, and she tried to make Tom see it in her face, but he wouldn't look. She wondered. Then she was just a grain troubled. Next a dim suspicion came and went, came again. She watched. A furtive glance told her worlds and then her heart broke, and she was jealous, and angry, and the tears came, and she hated everybody. Tom most of all, she thought. Tom was introduced to the judge, but his tongue was tied, his breath would hardly come, his heart quaked, partly because of the awful greatness of the man, but mainly because he was her parent. He would have liked to fall down and worship him if it were in the dark. The judge put his hand on Tom's head and called him a fine little man, and asked him what his name was. The boy stammered gasped and got it out. Tom! Oh, no, not Tom. It is Thomas. Ah, that's it. I thought there was more to it, maybe. That's very well. But you've another one, I dare say. And you'll tell it to me, won't you? Tell the gentleman your other name, Thomas, said Walters. And say, sir, you mustn't forget your manners. Thomas Sawyer, sir. That's it. That's a good boy. Fine boy. Fine manly little fellow. Two thousand verses is a great many, very, very great many, and you never can be sorry for the trouble you took to learn them. For knowledge is worth more than anything there is in the world. It's what makes great men and good men. You'll be a great man and a good man yourself some day, Thomas, and then you'll look back and say, It's all owing to the precious Sunday school privileges of my boyhood. It's all owing to my dear teachers that taught me to learn. It's all owing to the good superintendent who encouraged me and watched over me and gave me a beautiful Bible, a splendid, elegant Bible, to keep and have it all for my own, always. It's all owing to right bringing up. That is what you will say, Thomas, and you wouldn't take any money for those two thousand verses. No, indeed, you wouldn't. And now you wouldn't mind telling me and this lady some of the things you've learned. No, I, I know you wouldn't, for we are proud of little boys that learn. Now, no doubt you know the names of all the twelve disciples. Won't you tell us the names of the first two that were appointed?" Tom was tugging at a buttonhole and looking sheepish. He blushed now, and his eyes fell. Mr. Walter's heart sank within him. He said to himself, "'It is not possible that the boy can answer the simplest question. Why did the judge ask him?' Yet he felt obliged to speak up and say, "'Answer the gentleman, Thomas. Don't be afraid.' Tom still hung fire. "'Now I know you'll tell me,' said the lady. "'The names of the first two disciples were David and Goliath. "'Let us draw the curtain of charity over the rest of the scene.'" The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain Chapter 5 The Pinch Bug and His Prey about half-past ten the cracked bell of the small church began to ring, and presently the people began to gather for the morning sermon. The Sunday-school children distributed themselves about the house and occupied pews with their parents so as to be under supervision. Aunt Polly came, and Tom and Sid and Mary sat with her, Tom being placed next to the aisle, in order that he might be as far away from the open window and the seductive outside summer scenes as possible. The crowd filed up the aisles, 
the aged and needy postmaster, who had seen better days, the mayor and his wife, for they had a mayor there, among other unnecessaries, the justice of the peace, the widow Douglas, fair, smart, and forty, a generous, good-hearted soul, and well-to-do, her hill mansion the only palace in the town, and the most hospitable and much the most lavish in the matter of festivities that St. Petersburg could boast, the bent and venerable Major and Mrs. Ward, Lawyer Riverson, the new notable from a distance, next the belle of the village, followed by a troop of lawn-clad and ribbon-decked young heartbreakers, then all the young clerks in town in a body, for they had stood in the vestibule sucking their cane-heads, a circling wall of oiled and simpering admirers, till the last girl had run their gauntlet. And last of all came the model boy, Willie Mufferson, taking as heedful care of his mother as if she were cut glass. He always brought his mother to church, and was the pride of all the matrons. The boys all hated him. He was no good. And besides, he had been thrown up to them so much. His white handkerchief was hanging out of his pocket behind, as usual on Sundays, accidentally. Tom had no handkerchief, and he looked upon boys who had as snobs. The congregation being fully assembled now, the bell rang once more to warn laggards and stragglers, and then a solemn hush fell upon the church, which was only broken by the tittering and whispering of the choir in the gallery. The choir always tittered and whispered all through service. There was once a church choir that was not ill-bred, but I have forgotten where it was now. It was a great many years ago, and I can scarcely remember anything about it, but I think it was in some foreign country. The minister gave out the hymn, and read it through with a relish in a peculiar style which was much admired in that part of the country. His voice began on a medium key, and climbed steadily up till it reached a certain point, where it bore with strong emphasis upon the topmost word, and then plunged down as if from a springboard. Shall I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease, whilst others fight to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? He was regarded as a wonderful reader. At church sociables he was always called upon to read poetry, and when he was through the ladies would lift up their hands and let them fall helplessly in their laps, and wow their eyes and shake their heads, as much as to say, words cannot express it, it is too beautiful, too beautiful for this mortal earth. After the hymn had been sung, the Reverend Mr. Sprague turned himself into a bulletin board, and read off notices of meetings and societies and things, till it seemed that the list would stretch out to the crack of doom a queer custom which is still kept up in America, even in cities away here in this age of abundant newspapers. Often the less there is to justify a traditional custom, the harder it is to get rid of it. And now the minister prayed. A good, generous prayer it was, and went into details. It pleaded for the church, and the little children of the church, for the other churches of the village, for the village itself, for the county, for the state, for the state officers, for the United States, for the churches of the United States, for Congress, for the President, for the officers of the government, for poor sailors tossed by stormy seas, for the oppressed millions groaning under the heel of European monarchies and Oriental despotisms, for such as have the light and the good tidings, and yet have not eyes to see nor ears to hear withal, for the heathen in the far islands of the sea and closed with a supplication that the words he was about to speak might find grace and favor, and be as seed sown in fertile ground, yielding in time a grateful harvest of good. Amen. There was a rustling of dresses, and the standing congregation sat down. The boy whose history this book relates did not enjoy the prayer. He only endured it, if he even did that much. He was restive all through it, he kept tally of the details of the prayer unconsciously, for he was not listening, but he knew the ground of old and the clergyman's regular route over it, and when a little trifle of new matter was interlarded, his ear detected it and his whole nature resented it. He considered additions unfair and scoundrelly. 
In the midst of the prayer a fly had lit on the back of the pew in front of him, and tortured his spirit by calmly rubbing its hands together, embracing its head with its arms, and polishing it so vigorously that it seemed to almost part company with the body, and the slender thread of a neck was exposed to view. Scraping its wings with its hind legs, and smoothing them to its body as if they had been coat-tails, going through its whole toilet as tranquilly as if it knew it was perfectly safe, as indeed it was, for as sorely as Tom's hands itched to grab for it, they did not dare. He believed his soul would be instantly destroyed if he did such a thing while the prayer was going on, but with the closing sentence his hand began to curve and steal forward, and the instant the Amen was out, the fly was a prisoner of war. His aunt detected the act and made him let it go. The minister gave out his text and droned along monotonously through an argument that was so prosy that many a head by and by began to nod, and yet it was an argument that dealt in limitless fire and brimstone and thinned the predestined elect down to a company so small as to be hardly worth the saving. Tom counted the pages of the sermon. After church he always knew how many pages there had been, but he seldom knew anything else about the discourse. However, this time he was really interested for a little while. The minister made a grand and moving picture of the assembling together of the world's hosts at the millennium when the lion and the lamb should lie down together and a little child should lead them. But the pathos, the lesson, the moral of the great spectacle were lost upon the boy. He only thought of the conspicuousness of the principal character before the onlooking nations. His face lit with the thought, and he said to himself that he wished he could be that child if it was a tame lion. Now he lapsed into suffering again, as the dry argument was resumed. Presently he bethought him of a treasure he had, and got it out. It was a large black beetle with formidable jaws, a pinch-bug, he called it. It was in a percussion cap-box. The first thing the beetle did was to take him by the finger. A natural Philip followed. The beetle went floundering into the aisle, and lit on its back, and the hurt finger went into the boy's mouth. The beetle lay there working its helpless legs, unable to turn over. Tom eyed it, and longed for it, but it was safe out of his reach. Other people uninterested in the sermon found relief in the beetle, and they eyed it too. Presently a vagrant poodle-dog came idling along, sad at heart, lazy with the summer softness and the quiet, weary of captivity, sighing for change. He spied the beetle, the drooping tail lifted and wagged. He surveyed the prize, walked around it smelt at it from a safe distance, walked around it again, grew bolder, and took a closer smell, then lifted his lip and made a gingerly snatch at it, just missing it, made another and another, began to enjoy the diversion, subsided to his stomach with the beetle between his paws, and continued his experiments, grew weary at last, and then indifferent and absent-minded. His head nodded, and little by little his chin descended and touched the enemy who seized it, there was a sharp yelp, a flirt of the poodle's head, and the beetle fell a couple of yards away and lit on its back once more. The neighboring spectators shook with a gentle inward joy. Several faces went behind fans and handkerchiefs, and Tom was entirely happy. The dog looked foolish and probably felt so, but there was resentment in his heart, too, and a craving for revenge. So he went to the beetle and began a wary attack on it again. Jumping at it from every point of a circle, lighting with his forepaws within an inch of the creature, making even closer snatches at it with his teeth, and jerking his head till his ears flapped again. But he grew tired once more, after a while, tried to amuse himself with a fly, but found no relief, followed an ant around with his nose close to the floor, and quickly wearied of that, yawned, sighed, forgot the beetle entirely, and sat down on it. Then there was a wild yelp of agony, and the poodle went sailing up the aisle, the yelps continued, and so did the dog. He crossed the house in front of the altar. He flew down the other aisle. He crossed before the doors. He clambered up the home stretch. His anguish grew with his progress, till presently he was but a woolly comet moving in its orbit with a gleam and the speed of light. At last the frantic sufferer sheared from its course and sprang into its master's lap. He flung it out of the window, and the voice of distress quickly thinned away and died in the distance. By this time the whole church was red-faced and suffocating with suppressed laughter, and the sermon had come to a dead standstill. The discourse was resumed presently, but it went lame and halting, 
all possibility of impressiveness being at an end, for even the gravest sentiments were constantly being received with a smothered burst of unholy mirth under cover of some remote pew-back, as if the poor parson had said a rarely facetious thing. It was a genuine relief to the whole congregation when the ordeal was over and the benediction pronounced. Tom Sawyer went home quite cheerful, thinking to himself that there was some satisfaction about divine service when there was a bit of variety in it. He had but one marring thought. He was willing that the dog should play with his pinch-bug, but he did not think it was upright in him to carry it off. CHAPTER Six. TOM MEETS BECKY Monday morning found Tom Sawyer miserable. Monday morning always found him so, because it began another week's slow suffering in school. He generally began that day with wishing he had had no intervening holiday. It made the going into captivity in fetters again so much more odious. Tom lay thinking. Presently it occurred to him that he wished he was sick. Then he could stay home from school. Here was a vague possibility. He canvassed his system. No ailment was found, and he investigated again. This time he thought he could detect colicky symptoms, and he began to encourage them with considerable hope. But they soon grew feeble, and presently died wholly away. He reflected further. Suddenly he discovered something. One of his upper front teeth was loose. This was lucky. He was about to begin to groan as a starter, as he called it, when it occurred to him that if he came into court with that argument, his aunt would pull it out, and that would hurt. So he thought he would hold the tooth in reserve for the present and seek further. Nothing offered for some little time, and then he remembered hearing the doctor tell about a certain thing that laid up a patient for two or three weeks and threatened to make him lose a finger. So the boy eagerly drew his sore toe from under the sheet and held it up for inspection. But now he did not know the necessary symptoms. However, it seemed well worth while to chance it, so he fell to groaning with considerable spirit. But Sid slept on unconscious. Tom groaned louder, and fancied that he began to feel pain in the toe. No result from Sid. Tom was panting with his exertions by this time. He took a rest, and then swelled himself up and fetched a succession of admirable groans. Sid snored on. Tom was aggravated. He said, Sid! Sid! and shook him. This course worked well, and Tom began to groan again. Sid yawned, stretched, then brought himself up on his elbow with a snort, and began to stare at Tom. Tom went on groaning, and Sid said, Tom! Say, Tom! No response. Here, Tom! Tom! What is the matter, Tom? And he shook him and looked in his face anxiously. Tom moaned out, Oh! Don't, Sid! Don't joggle me! Why, what's the matter, Tom? I, I must call Auntie. No, never mind. It'll be over by and by, maybe. Don't call anybody. But I must. Don't groan so, Tom. It's awful. How long you been this way? Hours. Ouch! Oh, don't stir so, Sid. You'll, you'll kill me. Tom, why didn't you wake me sooner? Oh, Tom, don't. It makes my flesh crawl to hear you. Tom, what is the matter? I forgive you everything, Sid. Oh, everything you've ever done to me. When I'm gone, Tom, don't you, you ain't dying, are you? Don't, Tom, oh, don't. Maybe, oh, I forgive everything, Sid. Oh, tell him so, Sid. And, Sid, you give my window sash and my cat with one eye to that new girl that's come to town and, and tell her. But Sid had snatched his clothes and gone. Tom was suffering in reality now, so handsomely was his imagination working, and so his groans had gathered quite a genuine tone. Sid flew downstairs and said, "'Oh, Aunt Polly, come! Tom's dying!' "'Dying? Yes, and don't wait. Come quick!' "'Rubbish! I don't believe it!' But she fled upstairs, nevertheless, with Sid and Mary at her heels, and her face grew white, too, and her lip trembled. When she reached the bedside, she gasped out, "'You, Tom! Tom, what's the matter with you?' "'Oh, Auntie, I'm—' "'What's the matter with you? What is the matter with you, child?' "'Oh, Auntie, my sore toes mortified!' The old lady sank down into the chair and laughed a little, then cried a little, then did both together. This restored her, and she said, "'Tom, what a turn you did give me! Now you shut up that nonsense and climb out of this!' 
The groan ceased and the pain vanished from the toe. The boy felt a little foolish, and he said, Aunt Polly, it seemed mortified, and it hurt so I never minded my tooth at all. Your tooth, indeed. What's the matter with your tooth? One of them's loose, and it aches perfectly awful. There, there, now. Don't begin that groaning again. Open your mouth. Well, your tooth is loose, but you're not going to die about that. Mary, get me a silk thread and a chunk of fire out of the kitchen. Tom said, Oh, please, Auntie, don't pull it out. It don't hurt any more. I wish I may never stir if it does. Please don't, Auntie. I don't want to stay home from school. Oh, you don't, don't you? So all this row was because you thought you'd get to stay home from school and go a-fishing. Tom, Tom, I love you so, and you seem to try every way you can to break my old heart with your outrageousness. By this time the dental instruments were ready. The old lady made one end of the silk thread fast to Tom's tooth with a loop, and tied the other to the bedpost. Then she seized the chunk of fire, and suddenly thrust it almost into the boy's face. The tooth hung dangling by the bedpost now. But all trials bring their compensations. As Tom wended to school after breakfast, he was the envy of every boy he met, because the gap in his upper row of teeth enabled him to expectorate in a new and admirable way. He gathered quite a following of lads interested in the exhibition, and one that had cut his finger and had been a center of fascination and homage up to this time, now found himself suddenly without an adherent, and shorn of his glory. His heart was heavy, and he said with a disdain which he did not feel that it wasn't anything to spit like Tom Sawyer, but another boy said, sour grapes, and he wandered away a dismantled hero. Shortly Tom came upon the juvenile pariah of the village, Huckleberry Finn, son of the town drunkard. Huckleberry was cordially hated and dreaded by all the mothers of the town, because he was idle and lawless and vulgar and bad, and because all their children admired him so, and delighted in his forbidden society, and wished they dared to be like him. Tom was like the rest of the respectable boys, in that he envied Huckleberry his gaudy, outcast condition, and was under strict orders not to play with him. So he played with him every time he got a chance. Huckleberry was always dressed in the cast-off clothes of full-grown men, and they were in perennial bloom and fluttering with rags. His hat was a vast ruin, with a wide crescent lopped out of its brim. His coat, when he wore one, hung nearly to his heels, and had the rearward buttons far down the back, but one suspender supported his trousers. The seat of the trousers bagged low and contained nothing. The fringed legs dragged in the dirt when not rolled up. Huckleberry came and went at his own free will. He slept on doorsteps in fine weather and in empty hogsheads in wet. He did not have to go to school or to church, or call any being master or obey anybody. He could go fishing or swimming when and where he chose, and stay as long as it suited him. Nobody forbade him to fight. He could sit up as late as he pleased. He was always the first boy that went barefoot in the spring, and the last to resume leather in the fall. He never had to wash, nor put on clean clothes. He could swear wonderfully. In a word, everything that goes to make life precious, that boy had. So thought every harassed, hampered, respectable boy in St. Petersburg. Tom hailed the romantic outcast. Hello, Huckleberry. Hello yourself, and see how you like it. What's that you got? Dead cat. Let me see him, Huck. My, he's pretty stiff. Where'd you get him? Bought him off in a boy. What'd you give? I give a blue ticket and a bladder that I got at the slaughterhouse. Where'd you get the blue ticket? Bought it off in Ben Rogers two weeks ago for a hoop stick. Say, what is dead cats good for, Huck? Good for? Cure warts with. No, is that so? I know something that's better. I bet you don't. What is it? Why, spunk water. Spunk water? I wouldn't give a dern for spunk water. You wouldn't, wouldn't you? Do you ever try it? No, I hain't. But Bob Tanner did. Who told you so? Why, he told Jeff Thatcher, and Jeff told Johnny Baker, and Johnny told Jim Hollis, and Jim told Ben Rogers, and Ben told a nigger, and the nigger told me. There now. Well, what of it? They'll all lie, leastwise all but the nigger. I don't know him. But I never see a nigger that wouldn't lie. Shucks. Now you tell me how Bob Tanner done it, Huck. Why, he took and dipped his hand in a rotten stump where the rainwater was. In the daytime? Certainly. 
With his face to the stump? Yes. At least I reckon so. Did he say anything? I don't reckon he did. I, I don't know. Aha! Talk about trying to cure warts with spunk water such a blame fool way as that. Why, that ain't a going to do any good. You got to go all by yourself to the middle of the woods where you know there's a spunk water stump, and just as it's midnight, you back up against the stump and jam your hand in and say, Barleycorn, barleycorn, Injun meal shorts, spunk water, spunk water, swallow these warts, and then walk away quick, eleven steps, with your eyes shut, and then turn around three times and walk home without speaking to anybody, because if you speak, the charm's busted. Well, that sounds like a good way, but that ain't the way Bob Tanner done. No, sir, you can bet he didn't, because he's the wartiest boy in this town, and he wouldn't have a wart on him if he'd known how to work spunk water. I've took thousands of warts off my hands that way, Huck. I play with frogs so much I've always got considerable many warts. Sometimes I take em off with a bean. Yes, bean's good. I've done that. Have you? What's your way? You take and split the bean and cut the warts so as to get some blood, and then you put the blood on one piece of the bean and take and dig a hole and bury it about midnight at the crossroads in the dark of the moon, and then you burn up the rest of the bean. You see, that piece that's got the blood on it will keep drawing and drawing, trying to fetch the other piece to it, and so that helps the blood to draw the wart, and pretty soon off she comes. Yes, that's it, Huck, that's it. Though when you're burying it, if you say, Down, bean, off, wart, come no more to bother me, it's better. That's the way Joe Harper does, and he's been nearly to Coonville and most everywheres. But say, how do you cure him with dead cats? Why, you take your cat and go and get in the graveyard long about midnight when somebody that was wicked has been buried, and when it's midnight a devil will come, or maybe two or three, but you can't see him. You can only hear something like the wind, or maybe hear him talk, and when they're taking that feller away, you heave your cat after him and say, Devil follow corpse, cat follow devil, warts follow cat, I'm done with you. That'll fetch any wart. Sounds right. Do you ever try it, Huck? No, but old Mother Hopkins told me. Well, I reckon it's so, then, because they say she's a witch. Say? Why, Tom, I know she is. She witched Pap. Pap says so his own self. He come along one day, and he see she was a witch in him, so he took up a rock, and if she hadn't dodged, he'd a got her. Well, that very night he rolled off in the shed where he was a-layin' drunk and broke his arm. Why, that's awful. How did he know she was a witch in him? Lord, Pap can tell easy. Pap says when they keep looking at you right stiddy, they're witching you, especially if they mumble. Cause when they mumble, they're saying the Lord's Prayer backwards. Say, Hucky, when are you going to try the cat? Tonight. I reckon they'll come after old Hoss Williams tonight. But they buried him Saturday. Didn't they get him Saturday night? Why, how you talk. How could their charms work till midnight, and then it's Sunday? Devils don't slosh round much of a Sunday, I don't reckon. I never thought of that. That's so. Let me go with you. Of course, if you ain't afeard. Afeard? Tain't likely. Will you meow? Yes, and you meow back, if you get a chance. Last time you kept me a meowing around till old Hayes went to throwing rocks at me and says, Darn that cat! And so I hove a brick through his window. But don't you tell. I won't. I couldn't meow that night because Auntie was watching me. But I'll meow this time. Say, what's that? Nothing but a tick. Where'd you get him? Out in the woods. What'll you take for him? I don't know. I, I don't want to sell him. All right. It's a mighty small tick, anyway. Oh, anybody can run a tick down that don't belong to them. I'm satisfied with it. It's a good enough tick for me. Sho, there's ticks aplenty. I could have a thousand of them if I wanted to. Well, why don't you? Because you know mighty well you can't. This is a pretty early tick, I reckon. It's the first one I've seen this year. Say, Huck, I'll give you my tooth for him. Let's see it. Tom got out a bit of paper and carefully unrolled it. Huckleberry viewed it wistfully. The temptation was very strong. At last he said, Is it genuine? Tom lifted his lip and showed the vacancy. Well, all right, said Huckleberry. It's a trade. Tom enclosed the tick in the percussion cat box that had lately been the pinch-bug's prison, 
and the boys separated, each feeling wealthier than before. When Tom reached the little isolated frame schoolhouse, he strode in briskly, with the manner of one who had come with all honest speed. He hung his hat on a peg and flung himself into his seat with business-like alacrity. The master, throned on high in his great splint-bottom armchair, was dozing, lulled by the drowsy hum of study. The interruption roused him. "'Thomas Sawyer!' Tom knew that when his name was pronounced in full it meant trouble. "'Sir, come up here. Now, sir, why are you late again, as usual?' Tom was about to take refuge in a lie when he saw two long tails of yellow hair hanging down a back that he recognized by the electric sympathy of love, and by that form was the only vacant place on the girl's side of the schoolhouse. He instantly said, "'I stopped to talk with Huckleberry Finn.' The master's pulse stood still, and he stared helplessly. The buzz of study ceased. The pupils wondered if this foolhardy boy had lost his mind. The master said, "'You—you you did what?' Stop to talk with Huckleberry Finn. There was no mistaking the words. Thomas Sawyer, this is the most astounding confession I have ever listened to. No mere feral will answer for this offense. Take off your jacket. The master's arm performed until it was tired and the stock of switches notably diminished. Then the order followed. Now, sir, go and sit with the girls, and let this be a warning to you. The titter that rippled around the room appeared to abash the boy, but in reality that result was caused rather more by his worshipful awe of his unknown idol, and the dread pleasure that lay in his high good fortune. He sat down upon the end of the pine bench, and the girl hitched herself away from him with a toss of her head. Nudges and winks and whispers traversed the room, but Tom sat still with his arms upon the long, low desk before him, and seemed to study his book. By and by attention ceased from him, and the accustomed school murmur rose upon the dull air once more. Presently the boy began to steal furtive glances at the girl. She observed it, made a mouth at him, and gave him the back of her head for the space of a minute. When she cautiously faced around again, a peach lay before her. She thrust it away. Tom gently put it back. She thrust it away again, but with less animosity. Tom patiently returned it to its place. Then she let it remain. Tom scrawled on his slate, "'Please take it. I got more.' The girl glanced at the words, but made no sign. Now the boy began to draw something on the slate, hiding his work with his left hand. For a time the girl refused to notice, but her human curiosity presently began to manifest itself by hardly perceptible signs. The boy worked on, apparently unconscious. The girl made a sort of non-committal attempt to see it, but the boy did not betray that he was aware of it. At last she gave in, and hesitatingly whispered, "'Let me see it.' Tom uncovered a dismal caricature of a house with two gable ends to it, and a corkscrew of smoke issuing from the chimney. Then the girl's interest began to fasten itself upon the work as she forgot everything else. When it was finished she gazed a moment, then whispered, "'It's nice. Make a man.' The artist erected a man in the front yard that resembled a derrick. He could have stepped over the house, but the girl was not hypercritical. She was satisfied with the monster, and whispered, "'It's a beautiful man. Now make me coming along.' Tom drew an hourglass with a full moon and straw limbs to it, and armed the spreading fingers with a portentous fan. The girl said, "'It's ever so nice. I wish I could draw.' "'It's easy,' whispered Tom. "'I'll learn you.' "'Oh, will you? When?' At noon. Do you go home to dinner? I'll stay if you will. Good. That's a whack. What's your name? Becky Thatcher. What's yours? Oh, I know. It's Thomas Sawyer. That's the name they lick me by. I'm Tom when I'm good. You can call me Tom, will you? Yes. Now Tom began to scrawl something on the slate, hiding the words from the girl, but she was not backward this time. She begged to see. Tom said, Oh, it ain't anything. Yes, it is. "'No, it ain't. You, you don't want to see it.' "'Yes, I do. Indeed I do. Please let me.' "'You'll tell.' "'No, I won't. Deed and deed and double deed I won't.' "'You won't tell anybody at all? Ever as long as you live?' "'No, I won't ever tell anybody. Now let me.' "'Oh, you don't want to see. Now that you treat me so, I will see.' And she put her small hand upon his, and a little scuffle ensued, Tom pretending to resist in earnest, but letting his hand slip by degrees till these words were revealed. 
I love you. Oh, you bad thing! And she hit his hand a smart rap, but reddened and looked pleased nevertheless. Just at this juncture the boy felt a slow, fateful grip closing on his ear, and a steady lifting impulse. In that vice he was borne across the house and deposited in his own seat under a peppering fire of giggles from the whole school. Then the master stood over him during a few awful moments, and finally moved away to his throne without saying a word. But although Tom's ear tingled, his heart was jubilant. As the school quieted down, Tom made an honest effort to study, but the turmoil within him was too great. In turn he took his place in the reading class and made a botch of it, then in the geography class, and turned lakes into mountains, mountains into rivers, and rivers into continents, till chaos was come again, then in the spelling class, and got turned down by a succession of mere baby words, till he brought up at the foot and yielded up the pewter medal which he had worn with ostentation for months. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain Chapter 7 Tick Running and a Heartbreak the harder Tom tried to fasten his mind on his book, the more his ideas wandered. So, at last, with a sigh and a yawn, he gave it up. It seemed to him that the noon recess would never come. The air was utterly dead. There was not a breath stirring. It was the sleepiest of sleepy days. The drowsing murmur of the five-and-twenty studying scholars soothed the soul like the spell that is in the murmur of bees. Away off in the flaming sunshine, Cardiff Hill lifted its soft green sides through a shimmering veil of heat tinted with the purple of distance. A few birds floated on lazy wing high in the air. No other living thing was visible but some cows, and they were asleep. Tom's heart ached to be free, or else to have something of interest to do to pass the dreary time. His hand wandered into his pocket and his face lit up with a glow of gratitude that was prayer, though he did not know it. Then, furtively, the percussion cap box came out. He released the tick and put him on the long, flat desk. The creature probably glowed with a gratitude that amounted to prayer, too, at this moment, but it was premature, for when he started thankfully to travel off, Tom turned him aside with a pin and made him take a new direction. Tom's bosom friend sat next him, suffering just as Tom had been, and now he was deeply and gratefully interested in this entertainment in an instant. This bosom friend was Joe Harper. The two boys were sworn friends all the week and embattled enemies on Saturdays. Joe took a pin out of his lapel and began to assist in exercising the prisoner. The sport grew in interest momently. Soon Tom said that they were interfering with each other and neither getting the fullest benefit of the tick. So he put Joe's slate on the desk and drew a line down the middle of it from top to bottom. Now, said he, as long as he is on your side, you can stir him up, and I'll let him alone. But if you let him get away and get on my side, you're to leave him alone as long as I can keep him from crossing over. All right, go ahead. Start him up. The tick escaped from Tom presently and crossed the equator. Joe harassed him a while, and then he got away and crossed back again. This change of base occurred often. While one boy was worrying the tick with absorbing interest, the other would look on with interest as strong. The two heads bowed together over the slate, and the two souls dead to all things else. At last luck seemed to settle and abide with Joe. The tick tried this, that, and the other course, and got as excited and as anxious as the boys themselves, but time and again, just as he would have victory in his very grasp, so to speak, and Tom's fingers would be twitching to begin, Joe's pin would deftly head him off, and keep possession. At last Tom could stand it no longer. The temptation was too strong, so he reached out and lent a hand with his pin. Joe was angry in a moment. Said he, Tom, you let him alone. I only just want to stir him up a little, Joe. No, sir, it ain't fair. You just let him alone. Blame it, I ain't going to stir him much. Let him alone, I tell you. Well, I won't. You shall. He's on my side of the line. Look here, Joe Harper, whose is that tick? I don't care whose tick he is. He's on my side of the line, and you shan't touch him. Well, I'll just bet I will, though. He's my tick, and I'll do what I blame please with him, or die. A tremendous whack came down on Tom's shoulders, and its duplicate on Joe's, and for the space of two minutes the dust continued to fly from the two jackets and the whole school to enjoy it. 
The boys had been too absorbed to notice the hush that had stolen upon the school a while before, when the master came tiptoeing down the room and stood over them. He had contemplated a good part of the performance before he contributed his bit of variety to it. When school broke up at noon, Tom flew to Becky Thatcher and whispered in her ear, "'Put on your bonnet and let on you're going home, and when you get to the corner give the rest of them the slip, and turn down through the lane and come back. I'll go the other way and come it over them the same way.' So the one went off with one group of scholars and the other with another. In a little while the two met at the bottom of the lane, and when they reached the school they had it all to themselves. Then they sat together with a slate before them, and Tom gave Becky the pencil and held her hand in his, guiding it, and so created another surprising house. When the interest in art began to wane, the two fell to talking. Tom was swimming in bliss. He said, "'Do you love rats?' "'No, I hate them.' "'Well, I do, too. Live ones. But I mean dead ones, to swing round your head with a string. No, I, I don't care for rats much, anyway. What I like is chewing gum.' Oh, I should say so. I wish I had some now. Do you? I've got some. I'll let you chew it a while, but you must give it back to me. That was agreeable, so they chewed it turn about, and dangled their legs against the bench in excess of contentment. Was you ever at a circus? said Tom. Yes, and my pa's going to take me again sometime, if I'm good. I've been to the circus three or four times, lots of times. Church ain't shucks to a circus. There's things going on at a circus all the time. I'm going to be a clown in the circus when I grow up. Oh, are you? That will be nice. They're so lovely, all spotted up. Yes, that's so. And they get slathers of money, most a dollar a day, Ben Rogers says. Say, Becky, was you ever engaged? What's that? Why, engaged to be married. No. Would you like to? I reckon so. I don't know. What is it like? like? Why, it ain't like anything. You only just tell a boy you won't ever have anybody but him, ever, 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 and then you kiss, and that's all. Any, anybody can do it. Kiss? What do you kiss for? Why, that, you know, is to... Well, they always do that. Everybody? Why, yes, everybody that's in love with each other. Do you remember what I wrote on the slate? Y yes What was it? I shan't tell you. Shall I tell you? Yes, but some other time. No, now. No, not now. Tomorrow. Oh, no, now. Please, Becky, I'll whisper it. I'll, I'll whisper it ever so easy. Becky hesitating, Tom took silence for consent, and passed his arm about her waist and whispered the tale ever so softly, with his mouth close to her ear. And then he added, Now you whisper it to me, just the same. She resisted for a while, and then said, you turn your face away so you can't see, and, and then I will. But you mustn't ever tell anybody, will you, Tom? Now you won't, will you? No, indeed, indeed I won't. Now, Becky. He turned his face away, and she bent timidly around till her breath stirred his curls and whispered, I love you. Then she sprang away and ran around and around the desks and benches with Tom after her, and took refuge in a corner at last with her little white apron to her face. Tom clasped her about her neck and pleaded, "'Now, Becky, it's all done, all over but the kiss. Don't you be afraid of that. It ain't anything at all. Please, Becky.' And he tugged at her apron and the hands. By and by she gave up and let her hands drop. Her face, all glowing with the struggle, came up and submitted. Tom kissed the red lips and said, "'Now it's all done, Becky. And always after this, you know, you ain't ever to love anybody but me.' And you ain't ever to marry anybody but me. Never, never, and forever, will you? No, I'll never love anybody but you, Tom, and I'll never marry anybody but you. And you ain't to ever marry anybody but me, either. Certainly, of course. That, that's part of it. And always coming to school, or when we're going home, you're to walk with me, when there ain't anybody looking, and you choose me and I choose you at parties, because that's the way you do when you're engaged. It's so nice, I never heard of it before. Oh, it's ever so gay. Why, me and Amy Lawrence... The big eyes told Tom his blunder, and he stopped confused. Oh, Tom, then I ain't the first you've ever been engaged to. The child began to cry, and Tom said, Oh, don't cry, Becky. I don't care for her any more. 
Yes, you do, Tom. You know you do. Tom tried to put his arm about her neck, but she pushed him away and turned her face to the wall and went on crying. Tom tried again with soothing words in his mouth and was repulsed again. Then his pride was up, and he strode away and went outside. He stood about restless and uneasy for a while, glancing at the door every now and then, hoping she would repent and come to find him. But she did not. Then he began to feel badly and fear that he was in the wrong. It was a hard struggle with him to make new advances now, but he nerved himself to it and entered. She was still standing back there in the corner, sobbing, with her face to the wall. Tom's heart smote him. He went to her and stood a moment, not knowing exactly how to proceed. Then he said hesitatingly, "'Becky, I—I don't care for anybody but you.' No reply, but sobs. "'Becky,' pleadingly, "'Becky, won't you say something?' More sobs. Tom got out his chiefest jewel, a brass knob from the top of an andiron, and passed it around her so that she could see it, and said, "'Please, Becky, won't you take it?' She struck it to the floor. Then Tom marched out of the house and over the hills and far away to return to school no more that day. Presently Becky began to suspect. She ran to the door. He was not in sight. She flew around to the play-yard. He was not there. Then she called, "'Tom! Come back, Tom!' She listened intently, but there was no answer. She had no companions but silence and loneliness. So she sat down to cry again and upbraid herself. And by this time the scholars began to gather again, and she had to hide her griefs and still her broken heart and take up the cross of a long, dreary, aching afternoon, with none among the strangers about her to exchange sorrows with. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 A Pirate Bold to Be Tom dodged hither and thither through lanes until he was well out of the track of returning scholars, and then fell into a moody jog. He crossed a small branch two or three times, because of a prevailing juvenile superstition that to cross water baffles pursuit. Half an hour later he was disappearing behind the Douglas mansion on the summit of Cardiff Hill, and the schoolhouse was hardly distinguishable away off in the valley behind him. He entered a dense wood, picked his pathless way to the center of it, and sat down on a mossy spot under a spreading oak. There was not even a zephyr stirring. The dead noonday heat had even stilled the songs of the birds. Nature lay in a trance that was broken by no sound but the occasional far-off hammering of a woodpecker, and this seemed to render the pervading silence and sense of loneliness the more profound. The boy's soul was steeped in melancholy. His feelings were in happy accord with his surroundings. He sat long with his elbows on his knees and his chin in his hands, meditating. It seemed to him that life was but a trouble at best, and he more than half envied Jimmy Hodges, so lately released. It must be very peaceful, he thought, to lie and slumber and dream for ever and ever, with the wind whispering through the trees and caressing the grass and the flowers over the grave, and nothing to bother and grieve about ever any more. If he only had a clean Sunday school record, he could be willing to go and be done with it all. Now, as to this girl, what had he done? Nothing. He had meant the best in the world, and been treated like a dog, like a very dog. She would be sorry some day, maybe when it was too late. Ah, if he could only die temporarily. But the elastic heart of youth cannot be compressed into one constrained shape long at any time. Tom presently began to drift insensibly back into the concerns of this life again. What if he turned his back now and disappeared mysteriously? What if he went away? ever so far away, into unknown countries beyond the seas, and never came back any more. How would she feel then? The idea of being a clown recurred to him now, only to fill him with disgust. For frivolity and jokes and spotted tights were an offense when they intruded themselves upon a spirit that was exalted into the vague, august realm of the romantic. No, he would be a soldier, and return after long years all war-worn and illustrious. No, better still, he would join the Indians, and hunt buffaloes, and go on the warpath in the mountain ranges, and the trackless great plains of the far west, and away in the future come back a great chief, bristling with feathers, hideous with paint, and prance into Sunday school, some drowsy summer morning, with a blood-curling war-whoop, 
and sear the eyeballs of all his companions with unappeasable envy. But no, there was something gaudier even than this. He would be a pirate. That was it. Now his future lay plain before him and glowing with unimaginable splendor. How his name would fill the world and make people shudder. How gloriously he would go plowing the dancing seas in his long, low, black-hulled racer, the spirit of the storm, with his grisly flag flying at the fore. And at the zenith of his fame, how he would suddenly appear at the old village and stalk into church, brown and weather-beaten, in his black velvet doublet and trunks, his great jackboots, his crimson sash, his belt bristling with horse-pistols, his crime-rusted cutlass at his side, his slouch hat with waving plumes, his black flag unfurled with a skull and crossbones on it, and here, with swelling ecstasy, the whisperings, it's Tom Sawyer the pirate, the black avenger of the Spanish main. Yes, it was settled. His career was determined. He would run away from home and enter upon it. He would start the very next morning. Therefore he must now begin to get ready. He would collect his resources together. He went to a rotten log near at hand and began to dig under one end of it with his barlow knife. He soon struck wood that sounded hollow. He put his hand there and uttered this incantation impressively. What hasn't come here, come. What's here, stay here. Then he scraped away the dirt and exposed a pine shingle. He took it up and disclosed a shapely little treasure house whose bottom and sides were of shingles. In it lay a marble. Tom's astonishment was boundless. He scratched his head with perplexed air and said, Well, that beats anything. Then he tossed the marble away pettishly and stood cogitating. The truth was that a superstition of his had failed here, which he and all his comrades had always looked upon as infallible. If you buried a marble with certain necessary incantations and left it alone a fortnight, and then opened the place with the incantation he had just used, you would find that all the marbles you had ever lost had gathered themselves together there, meantime, no matter how widely they had been separated. But now this thing had actually and unquestionably failed. Tom's whole structure of faith was shaken to its foundations. He had many a time heard of this thing succeeding, but never of its failing before. It did not occur to him that he had tried it several times before, himself, but could never find the hiding places afterward. He puzzled over the matter some time, and finally decided that some witch had interfered and broken the charm. He thought he would satisfy himself on that point, so he searched around till he found a small sandy spot with a little funnel-shaped depression in it. He laid himself down and put his mouth close to this depression and called, Doodlebug, Doodlebug, tell me what I want to know. Doodlebug, Doodlebug, tell me what I want to know. The sand began to work, and presently a small black bug appeared for a second and then darted under again in a fright. He doesn't tell, so it was a witch that done it. I just knowed it. He well knew the futility of trying to contend against witches, so he gave up discouraged. But it occurred to him he might as well have the marble he had just thrown away, and therefore he went and made a patient search for it. But he could not find it. Now he went back to his treasure house and carefully placed himself just as he had been standing when he tossed the marble away. Then he took another marble from his pocket and tossed it in the same way, saying, Brother, go find your brother. He watched where it stopped and went there and looked. But it must have fallen short or gone too far, so he tried twice more. The last repetition was successful. The two marbles lay within a foot of each other. Just here the blast of a toy tin trumpet came faintly down the green aisles of the forest. Tom flung off his jacket and trousers, turned a suspender into a belt, raked away some brush behind the rotten log, disclosing a rude bow and arrow, a lath sword, and a tin trumpet, and in a moment had seized these things and bounded away bare-legged with fluttering shirt. He presently halted under a great elm, blew an answering blast, and then began to tiptoe and look warily out, this way and that. He said cautiously to an imaginary company, Hold, my merry men, keep hid till I blow. Now appeared Joe Harper, as airily clad and elaborately armed as Tom. Tom called, Hold! Who comes into Sherwood Forest without my pass? Guy of Giesborne wants no man's pass. Who art thou that that 
dares to hold such language, said Tom, prompting, for they talked by the book from memory. Who art thou that dares to hold such language? I, indeed, I am Robin Hood, as thy caitiff carcass soon shall know. Then art thou indeed that famous outlaw? Right gladly will I dispute with thee the passes of the merry wood. Have at thee! They took their last swords, dumped their other traps on the ground, and struck a fencing attitude, foot to foot, and began a grave, careful combat, two up and two down. Presently Tom said, "'Now, if you've got the hang, go it lively!' So they went it lively, panting and perspiring with the work. By and by Tom shouted, "'Fall! Fall! Why don't you fall?' "'I shan't! Why don't you fall yourself? You're getting the worst of it.' "'Why, that ain't anything. I can't fall. That ain't the way it is in the book. The book says, then with one black-handed stroke he slew poor Guy of Giesborne. You're to turn round and let me hit you on the back. There was no getting around the authorities, so Joe turned, received the whack, and fell. Now, said Joe, getting up, you got to let me kill you. That's fair. Why, I can't do that. It ain't in the book. Well, it's blamed mean, that's all. Well, say, Joe, you can be Friar Tuck or, or Much, the miller's son, and lamb me with a quarter-staff. Or I'll be the sheriff of Nottingham, and you be Robin Hood a little while, and kill me. This was satisfactory, and so these adventures were carried out. Then Tom became Robin Hood again, and was allowed by the treacherous nun to bleed his strength away through his neglected wound. And at last Joe, representing a whole tribe of weeping outlaws, dragged him sadly forth, gave his bow into his feeble hands, and Tom said, Where this arrow falls, there bury poor Robin Hood under the greenwood tree. Then he shot the arrow and fell back, and would have died, but he lit on a nettle, and sprang up too gaily for a corpse. The boys dressed themselves, hid their accoutrements, and went off grieving that there were no outlaws any more, and wondering what modern civilization could claim to have done to compensate for their loss. They said they would rather be outlaws a year in Sherwood Forest than President of the United States forever. End of chapter 8